creepy pasta is defined by Encyclopedia Dramatica as the internet definition for short stories designed to unnerve, disturb, elicit a negative emotional response from, and scare the reader. As with anything found on the internet, the quality varies widely from one example to the next. Look, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Content is king. So if you have some content you need created, hit up IOPvideo.com. Video production, podcasting, you name it, we can do it. IOPvideo.com. We make things look pretty. God, it's Halloween season, our favorite time of the year. And we got a very, very, very special episode for you today. Are you strapped in? Is the lights off? Is the candles lit? Because we are talking about our top 10-ish favorite Frosted Mini Fierce episodes. Now, if y'all don't know, uh, half of us used to produce the Frosted Mini Fierce web series. So we're going to be a little biased today. But whatever, it's our show. Suck a dick. Let's go. JD, Joaquin, Casper, Frosted Mini Fierce. Woo! I used to with some That's pretty a, heavy language. I, I, I used to. Okay. Like, <laughs> it has been like a year since we did anything. I, yeah, but I we also had like two or three episode. years in between the break. I mean, we could always make more stuff. There are also the, the world. And we brought JD on right now. So who knows when we're going to be able to get back to it. That's, that's true. That's and we true. brought JD on board as an official, you know, uh, as, as a... As a, a a member, so I'm like, let's not, you know, me and JD and, and are actually just, talking about the upcoming strip for the show. Anyway, yeah, what the fuck? It's like we, that's a conversation. We used it. to be involved. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I'm excited. When, when honestly, because the whole talk about me being part of this came before the podcast was even uh, an idea. So this um, podcast um, happened because of an episode of Frosted Mini Fears. Exactly. Yeah, so I owe the success of the voice party to... Which is why we're doing this episode, because it's very near and dear to almost everyone here. And it's our one-year anniversary, almost, which kind of brings it on. That's the truth. Circle, I love circles. That's my favorite Punch Malone song. Circles are great. That's my favorite shape. Um I I am very grateful for you know okay here's the thing, um, I I I had no idea what you guys were filming the the devils mm-hmm. do for I, I just I know you do you do film <laughs> and uh, that's all I knew like I you know so when when I actually when you guys actually released it and I got involved with you guys. I was like, oh, these guys don't just do go to work fitness. <laughs> you know, yeah. there is a lot more that these guys do. And then I saw what you guys have going on at Frosted Mini Fierce. Just just describe to the listeners. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure you we've heard it before, but if they're new to the podcast, they're probably gonna be listening to this as a recent episode. Mm-hmm. Describe why don't you guys describe what Frosted Mini Fears is? Um so Frosted Mini Fears uh, is a horror anthology web series. Um, we, it, it, it spawned out of creepy pastas. So like Slender Man and Jeff the Killer and all that stuff, that was the creepy pasta genre. And we kind of spawned off from yeah. that. And we did the show at a time where creepy pasta was like really popular and they were making games about Slender Man. But for the most part, creepy pastas were like internet stories. It was just stuff on message boards. Um, occasionally you'd get somebody like narrating a story over a generic slideshow on YouTube, but that was about as far as it goes. And so we kind of saw an opportunity to do something different within the, the genre and make more like 
cinematic creepy pastas and make like short films and make stuff with like abstract visuals, but that are also very cinematic and just kind of do something with it to kick things up a notch and put our own uh, spin on it. And it's, it's pretty successful, wouldn't you say, Joaquin? Oh yeah, no, one hundred percent. I agree with that. They yeah, we ended up having uh, we ended up uh, having a couple panels at conventions, um, so that was fun. We've oh, been in film festivals. We've won awards. It's been uh, it's been a hell of a thing. It's been a hell of a thing. Well, I did, I, I and I know you have a, a large following on on uh, YouTube. Um, I you know I'm I was blown away, man. The, I know you guys aren't the only ones in the crew. You guys have a whole ensemble, but it's just literally just you two now. Yeah, right? we we started off with two voice actors, two writers, and then me as like the audio visual guy. And then over the years, people would come, people would go, and the roster would change. And as of October 2020, it's me, Joaquin, and JD as the surviving cast members. So I it's you say surviving, but I'm brand new to yeah. this. And everything that I've kind of have written, <laughs> like we haven't ever been able to film because as soon as I came in, kind of the yeah, the COVID, world ended. It took over. But, yeah, and the world. Yeah, ended. but we. But I, and even even uh, another uh, even uh, Gaspar at one point was involved, right? No. Oh no! I, well, didn't he do? Didn't he do something for you guys uh, too? He, just. He did something not related to Frosted Mini Fears, but he did make that zombie oh, music video. Oh, I, I, no, I thought you guys did something with Frosted Mini Fears. Nah. Oh, my bad. I, I told Are you Are you still yeah, there? Yeah. Oh, he's just okay. listening. He's like, you're I'm like, going to see what they say. Wait, you're talking for him? What the fuck? <laughs> I, was never in, uh, I was never in uh, with the Frosted Mini Fears. I, I asked, but you asked oh shoot and that was you before applied? my time when he asked too I think yeah. when he was applying for I asked I asked well, yeah, two people you... and I was set, I was told no by three people <laughs> that's hilarious <laughs> imagine, imagine if that happened at an actual job like you call you apply for an application and someone <laughs> goes out of their way to tell you no yeah hey I know you applied and I know I'm not related to that company whatsoever. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. No. Like we That's actually work related. for I actually work for a different company with an entirely different business model <laughs> and we do different things than they do, but no. <laughs> I know you applied for McDonald's, but this is Burger King and not No, not even that. I know you applied for McDonald's, but uh <laughs> this is this is Red Lobster and no. Sorry. <laughs> you can't work for McDonald's. Yeah, sorry, bro. Yeah, you can't. I, no, fuck no. I just want. I just wanted to tell you on the phone. Fuck no. Now, now I should point out something even more special about this very special episode. Since Frost Mini Fears yeah. is a property that we own the intellectual rights to, that means we can use the footage oh. without getting DMCA takedown notices. So if you happen to be watching this video on YouTube. There's a good chance I'm gonna put footage of what we're talking about in the video for a change. That's a first it, ever because we're finally now. talking about something we own the rights to. Ooh, yeah, that's that's. And while you're at it, if you're a listener and you're a subscriber to the Voice Party, why don't you go ahead and just subscribe to Frosted Mini Fears? It's all the same. There you game, go, baby. There you go. Cross promotion time. Cross promotion. I I I. You know what? Okay, all right. Here, I'll say I'll say this because we're all gonna talk about this, but God damn it, I want to talk about it first because I was very honored by you guys. Um, I, okay, my my whole introduction to this thing. I'm sitting at home. I have a show on Saturday, and uh, it's Thursday or whatever or Friday, and I'm nervous because I have to come up with jokes about cats. That that's that's the <laughs> that's the whole. I did thing, that show. Yes. Gaspar did that. Show. That's yeah. a hard thing, right? For not not a cat person. Yeah. I'm not a cat person. I have a dog who's currently chewing on my hand. Anyways, um, so I'm sitting and I'm I'm fucking trying to come up with cat jokes, and all of a sudden I get this text message, who is Phil, who I don't really know, who I don't really talk to. I've seen him 
maybe six times in my whole life. He's like, hey, would you like to be in a music video? I'm like, uh, sure, <laughs> yeah. And um, and then you sent me that video, um, which was for Devil's yeah. Do. And, yeah. What did uh, what had happened, Joaquin? Do you want to talk about like the genesis of your your song, Devil's Do? Now, for for people who are longtime listeners, you have heard the story already. But I'll refresh for the new ones. Um, I think this is actually we talked about this in episode one, <laughs> September yes. twenty. Uh, September 16th, 2019. Yes. Um, so essentially the origin of this record is basically like I was, you know, I was in a rap group and longtime listeners know. And uh, then all of a sudden I was solo. Long story short. And uh, Phil and I were talking about things that we haven't done before for the channel. We're in season four. We want to come back in a major way. And then I think it was Phil's idea. I was like, what if we, it was Phil's idea, 100%. Phil goes, what if we did like a rap song? And you're the, the only rapper I know. So how about we just have you come in and, and you know, write and perform the songs? Okay. So we, we went looking for a beat. And, you know, we went on like, we had Nobi on the show recently. Um, shout out to Nobi um, as a recent guest. But we, I went through Nobi's catalog because he's one of the handful of producers that I know and I trust. You know what I mean? He's just not some dude on the internet on the other side that I can't just be like, hey, bro, could you, you know what I mean? Like, he's going to work with me. You know, I've recorded with Nobi all the nine months, right? Yeah. So, you know, I we're looking through his uh, catalog and a lot of it was just sort of like, oh, I, I was like, this has a dark tone to it. But Phil was like, ah, it's too up-tempo, too up-tempo. So we finally settled on the beat we both like. We went halves on it. And um, we ordered that beat. They, they sent us the beat. Still had the tags. And we're like, yo, man, could you send us the beat without the tags? And lo and behold... What, 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 sorry, just, just to get some uh, an idea. What, what, what do you mean by tags? I don't, you know. Oh, so producers, in order f- to protect their work... They will have uh, yeah. these vocal sound bites all throughout the instrumental, right? So let's say they're – it's usually their name, right? So let's say their name is Nobi and like – or and they'll tag in like or their full name and then like the fact that they make beats. So Nobi's is Nobi Inf Gang Beats Beats. And that just kind of like mm-hmm. repeats every like four or five uh, bars on the tag version of the beat. So it's like a water you're like, music, doom, right? doom, 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 like, yeah, water doom, 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 if gang beats. So, <laughs> a water and, basically. Yeah, it's a watermark. It's a, it's a, a, a sound watermark. And, and essentially, a sonic <laughs> watermark. This was, and essentially, like, when you buy the beat exclusively, they give you the version without tags. Well, what happened is something occurred. Something went wrong with his uh, his his files, like his his drive, and he lost the original beat, and he had to remake it from scratch, right? So I had to send him that. And the thing, the thing that I respect about Novi is like, you know, he had he had pulled together certain synthetic instruments, and you know, had them pitched a certain way and all that. And you can't always remember what you used to make those original sounds. So he was able to cobble something together that was the same melody, the same tone. But what you're listening to when you hear the uh, Devils Do is you're listening to a refashioned beat that sounds similar to the beat that Phil and I originally bought. But it's not the same because the instruments are a little different. Like the the speed of the beat is the same the melody is the same but the instruments are just a little bit different um is it to make it and i hmm? was it to make it because he had to make it all from no no because he had to make it all from memory Oh, because he lost the original file set yeah (laughs) so he had to like build it back from scratch yeah. And and, you know, and he couldn't remember all the original instruments that he used, but he remembered like the tempo and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So and, 
Shout outs to Nobi for being talented enough to like resurrect a beat from the dead, essentially, like from Oblivion. It's like, you know, if you wanna, Thanos who, snapped his Nobi. fingers and wished the beat out of existence and he brought it back in. You know. Yeah, and if you want to know who if you're listening and you want to know who Nobi is, check out our episode with Nobi. It's on the yeah. well, when we were when we were conceiving. Yep. So it's it's yep, that's right. So anywho, um we we go in and like all right, so I I, I always start out my songs with a concept, right? My song is going to be about this. And, well, actually, I start off with beat. So I go beat searching first. Sometimes it's beat first. Sometimes it's concept first. But, you know, once I get a concept, then comes the hook. I used to write verses first when I first started. But, it, eh. but with a hook, you have the spine of your song. You have a direction your song is going to go, and you can put your lyrics in a neat box. Because you don't want to draw outside the lines unless you're purposely trying to be non sequitur, right? So I always say hook first. So I wrote the hook, and I sent, you know, I, I brush it by Phil, and it ends up being this sort of progressive thing, right? Because the first hook, because the song, listeners at home, it's all about how the devil, this is Phil's idea. You know, Phil was like, now the devil tempts people to do terrible things right the a lot you know in some some folks theology that's how he operates and i'm like yeah what if we made a song about that okay so i took the approach of the devil doesn't just come in and tell you to like rob some random dude there's there's usually in my mind small things to chip away at your conscience right and that's where I got the hook from for this. And I was, it's okay, it's going to start off benign enough, right? Hear no evil. See no evil. You know, do no evil. But if you choose otherwise, take my advice. Tell him the devil made you do it. And so this is like the devil singing to the, the, the perpetrator the slash victim here. Um, and, you know, and it's sort of like, yeah, there are these rules, you're not supposed to do them, but if you do it, just blame it on me, right? And from there, you get the second hook, right? And the second hook is progressively worse. Now the devil is encouraging you to go ahead and do these things, right? You know, say what you feel, do what you want, right? Right? Um, and if you take offense, and if they take offense to it, tell them, you, you know, the devil made you do it. And then by the third verse, things have gotten so horrific. The devil's just like, you know, um, make it obscene. Um, hear them scream, make them obs- make it obscene. And if they take offense to it, tell them the devil made you do it, right? And once I had that hook in, I was like, okay, I got to come up with the, the story and see how it, how it goes from there. So, you know, and, and it was all about a guy who's walking home at night and he gets robbed. And how many people have had that something similar like that happen where they just get unjustly robbed, seemingly at random for no reason, right? And... You go through this process, right? You might be scared. You might immediately want retribution, right? You might think, call the police. And so the devil plays on these ideas of, well, you know what I mean? You can't be a punk and the police aren't going to, like, get to him in time. And, you know, he, he, you better just – here. there's a bottle on the ground right there. Take him out right now. You know what I mean? And it's like, oops, oops, you killed him. You've gone too far. And then the second verse is – now you have to bury the body and chop him up and all this terrible stuff, right? You know, and he gets more and more gruesome. Um, and then the video treatment really pulls it together. And this song is meant to be on, like, my first solo album, which has been delayed thanks to COVID-19, um, called Tales to Astonish. So it's really, like, sort of a double marketing tool in the video ends up being because, one... It's showing you this, I mean, as, a, as an artistic point, it's showing you this dope hip-hop story that's a horror story set to music, set to hip-hop, meant to 
be something to like expand our channel a little bit, but at the same time promoting my album. You know what I mean? And this is the first this is the first music video for for us and me. Yes. Um yeah, no, I was saying like when we were conceiving the video, we wanted to do uh different things for season four. We wanted to branch out and do short films, we wanted to do audio stories. Um, and we had this idea to do this music video and we were, when we were conceiving the song, we were conceiving the story in tandem with the song. Like, I think even when I, when I was pitching the idea to Joaquin, like there were certain visuals that like I had in my head that I wanted. Um, and he would write those into the song and we even like storyboarded it out. And originally we were going to put Nobi in the video. But for scheduling reasons, uh, it didn't work. He, he wasn't able to make it. And so it was like the 11th hour, and we were trying to think, well, who else can we put in this? Because, you know, we didn't want to push it back, um, and we didn't know when he was going to be free. And I remember you had done that uh, zombie music video with Gasper. Masterpiece. A masterpiece, okay. And so, oh, <laughs> Evan's in the video. JD knows Evan. JD's been in a music video, sort of. I've worked with him. So uh, let me reach out to him and see if he's interested. And so what I had done is I had sent you a message. And this is the first time I had done this, but I actually, like, storyboarded this whole music video out, like, shot by shot. And then I set those storyboards to the song. So it was almost like an animatic. And I kind of sent that to everybody who was going to be in the video so we all could like be on the same page with like what was going to happen and the tone and how everything is going to play out. Cause I remember um, from my point of view, I sent you the message and you were like, well, I mean, I don't know. I got something going on that day. And I was like, well, here's, here's the animatic of what we're going to do. And then all of a sudden, um, <laughs> you saw yeah, all of a sudden you were like, I'm in, I'll cancel my plans. When do you need me? I'll be there. Do you need me two days? Well, you know what I was, you know what I I need was thinking? Me you know what I was thinking? Uh, my my and what was going through my head when you sent me you know asked me if I wanted to be in a music video, but you know I already I was already in the music video. Like what could literally top that, man? You know I don't think. <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. Guess why? No, that that was a masterpiece for the time. It has an age uh, well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, no. So I I I when you told me music video, honestly. What went through my mind is like I don't know some some uh, some dance number or some bullshit you know yeah. <laughs> like some something like I'm gonna have to dance and like last time I I was with you on a music video set I had to dance <laughs> and I was like well fuck no man uh, last time <laughs> you were behind the camera like nah dude I'm probably gonna you know pass. what's funny and then, I would never uh, dance in front of a camera. <laughs> I know, and I, I did the worm and everything. But anyways, that, that, yeah. So I, that was, that I still had the taste of that in my mouth from filming that. Not that oh, I was no. bad, I just, I don't, I don't want to dance, you know. But sorry, I, I know we were talking about this one yeah. a lot. We have a lot to cover, but I'm just, I'm glad that happened because it really, like, I, I'll say this, that that whole experience changed my life. Yeah, no, because what was crazy is like. um we know how it was filming like Gaspar's music video, but with this one, because it's like I do this like for a living, like I make videos like professionally. So, yeah. like I had storyboarded everything out, and I had the storyboard printed out, and so literally, like we're just like going down and going off the board and shooting this shot, check, shooting this shot, check, shooting this shot, check, and we flew through that thing. Like we broke it up over two days. Uh, we did the stuff in the woods the second day, and then the stuff in the, the city the first day and each day we were done in two hours that was quick that was really quick i, I remember that, yeah. that we mentioned this before but that was like the most easy uh free-flowing uh shoot that we ever did and uh it, 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 i remember we only, we took maybe what two or three shots maximum of each thing we did yeah because yeah, we had everything planned out so i didn't need to sit there and waste time going hmm should this be a wide angle should this be a low should this be a high like i already had it planned out so which, uh, which was yeah great. and if, if you go and i'm i don't know if this is in the episode or if this is just when you're bullshitting with them but when we had tomorrow's june on the show um we were showing them that video and they were like you shot that in four hours it took us 14 yeah. hours to shoot the say video 
<laughs> yeah, I remember that. That was in there when they we had them on. Yeah, that's crazy. That I I, I for, to shoot a scene. I don't want to say who, whatever. To shoot a scene for something else I did. Not oh, you, no, Gaspar. Course, I was a master. I'm not saying. No, no, I know, but it was it, well. This other thing was good too, but I just, anyways, mm. to shoot one scene, it literally took us forty-five minutes, and it was a scene that was like a second, and I was like, "What the hell are you doing, man?" I mean, what are you? Doing? It helps that there was like no dialogue, like nobody had to memorize anything. It's just like hit your mark, cool. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, that that so. Okay, so that that was the first time doing something like that for Frosty Meat Furious. I want you to talk about, or you guys, whoever wants to go and like continue on their list, and maybe, you know, because I know you guys don't want to mention stuff you've been heavily involved with. I, I mean, my list not is not one be biased, but for me on my list, I know I'm, it's gonna be biased, but that's that's my favorite, uh, one of my favorite uh, Frosty Meat Furious. <laughs> And it's the, the, I'll put it at the top of my list because it literally had an impact on me. Yeah. And you can, it's, it's not a lot of videos. You can go on YouTube and say, oh, this, this changed my life. <laughs> and it's like, it's not that I found like whatever, like fame from that video, but I discovered YouTube. And now you're like some of my closest friends. Okay. So I'll put that on, I'll put that on the top of my okay. list. Okay. All right. Uh, Joaquin, what, what's what's next on your list? Do you have another favorite wanna, on your list? I want to I want to hear yours before I go down mine. I want to hear yours, bro. Well, let, let, well, instead of going all the way down my alley, let, we'll ping pong. We'll go back and forth. Okay. All right. Well, well I mean, we just covered one on my list. I want to hear one on yours. You want to hear one on my list? Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'll be honest. I didn't really arrange these from like worst to best. I literally just looked at the YouTube page and was like, "Oh yeah, I like that one." All right, I like that one too. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see here. What's one I what's one I can do? Um, oh, you know what? Here's here's what I can do. One that's on my list is actually uh one of actually I think it might have been the the first or second thing we had you write for the show, Joaquin, and that's Last Man Alive. Oh my gosh, that was on my that was on my list too, just because of that reason. Okay, so. Oh. <laughs> Those of you who don't know, you know, there's one idea I had. I think it was season two when we did this one. Is there's the like, you know, like short, like you know, like creepies or short horror stories. But there was like one sentence horror stories that I had found, you know, and there was one horror story where it was literally just the last man alive here to knock on his door, fucking scary. And I was like, well, what if we fucking flesh that out into like an actual story? And I remember we had just brought Joaquin in. I think he might have done like our promo for our Fanime panel, but that was maybe it at that time. And it was me, Chad, and Joaquin having a little powwow. And we're trying to like hammer out, like me and Chad are trying to hammer out the details of the story, like plausibly, how would this work? And we're trying to figure out the logistics and have it make sense. And nothing's working. We're banging our heads against the wall. And Joaquin was just like, you mind if I take a stab at it? And we're like, yeah, go ahead. So then, like, we moved on to something else. And then Joaquin was like, all right, here's what I got. And he read it off to us. And me and Chad looked at each other and looked at him. We were like, save, press save, press save right now. (laughs) And that that one was which one? So this one's called Last Man Alive. Um, Last. Yeah, basically, it's about it's about a kid who. Uh, was playing in this old well in their backyard and he tripped and fell and the fucking sky fell. Fucking 2020 happened. And then he just <laughs> comes out of the well, fucking everything's leveled. He's the last person alive. And he's spent years trying this. to find another human being, hasn't found any. And he's just going crazy from solitude. And then lo and behold, there's a fucking knock on his door. Oh, wow. I think I've heard of... Is that from a... Po- so that's what I was going to ask you guys about Fresh and Mini Fears. Is some of the content from inspired from books or short or, or anything else? Um, yes. A lot of it is stuff we wrote ourselves. A lot of it is okay. stuff we've adapted. Um, it's like covers of stories or stuff that's inspired by stories. Um, but some of it... So it's a mixture. It's a mixture of original stuff. It's a mixture of covers... Uh, Joaqu- Joaquin, what are, what are your memories on Last Man Alive? You know, I, I 
I remember writing the promo, but I kind of feel like Last Man Alive was my first day on the job, legit. Like, I feel like, because <laughs> I feel like I was still sort of earning my stripes, you know, and I hadn't yet made a complete impression. I was new. And even though Phil and I had worked together on some creative stuff before that, um, backyard wrestling and that kind of thing. So you knew I had a mind for creativity. You knew I had a writer's kind of, you know what I mean? Like, they had never tried me out in this fashion. And Chad had never, like, done anything creative with me before. So this was, like, my proving ground. And I remember you guys are having difficulty with that script. And I just was just like, this is my chance, you know? And I looked over the script and I'm like, okay, this is a good premise. Uh, this is a good plot. And it's a great ending. It's the kind of ending that I love. I love twist ending. Um, Phil, you still there? Yeah, I'm right here. Oh, great, 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 great. Okay, audio is perfect. I'm to search just safe. <laughs> if Phil goes, we all <laughs> but, but well, no, no. I just we had some some issues earlier where I couldn't hear Phil, and I, oh, you know yeah, I, mean? yeah, I just want to yeah. make sure because we were both here at this time. Oh, yeah, but sure. so it just it's just one of those things where I love the idea so much, and I was like, what this needs is like a little bit more fleshing out and a very strong narrator, and we, that needs to convey to the to the listeners and to the viewers exactly how catastrophic and devastating this is you know what mm -hmm. i mean like how do i touch the most people so and i hit on everything man i hit him, I hit him. and and that was another thing because at the time the way we had it is we had chad and sal who were writers we had carlos and efren who were our voice actors I was like the behind the scenes producer. Occasionally Chad would narrate something. Occasionally I would narrate something. But we we essentially had like dedicated voice actors. But we tried something different because we, we were so impressed with like the way he like his treatment on our story. So and I knew he could act. So we like let him narrate it. And I remember like when we were recording his narration, like he'd get through the whole story in one take and it was perfect. And there was no flubs. And like all the nuance was there. And me and Chad were like, fucking one tank. Holy shit. Because normally with our voice actors, you know, people flub. You got to start over. There's some editing magic. There's multiple takes. Motherfucking knocked it in one. I mean, it helped that it was short and that I wrote it. You know what I mean? Like that, that, that helped. It, 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 it's kind of like rap training. You know, you, you train yourself to memorize your own words so that when, and you get the cadences and the right sort of pitch moments and i just adapted all of that you know memorization technique into the reading and i really felt what i was reading too you know like i was very passionate about man the world is really ended and i i'm so i just got into that character it's a desperate, well, I, I remember lonely like, character yeah and I, I remember one of the things you did that like i really like impressed me and chad was when me and Chad were like debating, like, well, how does the fucking world end? And I was like, oh, a nuclear strike. And he's like, there's no fucking heads up. Nobody on the planet has a heads up that there's a nuclear strike. And so he wanted to do like a meteor strike. And I was like, no fucking scientist has a telescope, really. And so for like, we're going back and forth trying to figure out how the world was going to end. And in your story, you kept it vague. You just, that was hey, the day. Did, hey, did virus... Would asymptomatic virus ever come up? <laughs> asymptomatic viruses never came up. But when, when you did walk in, you, in your script, you kept it vague. You just said, that was the day the sky fell. And I was like, oh, shit. So. Yeah, I, I, re I really like metaphors and hyperbole. So that's that, too, comes from like that poet rap background. Yeah. <laughs> but I was just like, because I was just like, look, we don't have to know the details. We yeah. just need to know everything went to pot. So that's that's on both of you guys. Yeah, that was on, is that what so I'm that was on both of our lists? That's just on um, your list. Uh, Gasper, Bill? do you have a favorite Frosted Mini Fears episode? You haven't said anything yet. Um, I don't know the name of it. Uh, it's the one where you guys used like real footage, or it's on. I know it's on the first season. You you used real footage of some girl in a in a elevator. Oh, that's the Cecil Hotel. Cecil Hotel. The Cecil. No, that's on my list too, man. So what, what that that's was is there was this woman named Elisa Lamb who they found her like in a water tank on top yeah. of a hotel 
and no one can figure out how she got in there because they had to like cut the fucking tank open to get her out because it was sealed. And so her mystery, her death was a fucking mystery. And uh, Chad had written this story about it. And I literally had like no footage to work with. I had to pull shit out of thin air to make this happen. And Chad was basically just like, oh, here's some news reports talking about what happened. And here's the unedited security footage of her tripping in an elevator. See what you can do with it. And so I had to like pull this out of thin air and make this happen. So I like took the elevator footage and I like chopped it up, moved shit around, and I used jump cuts to make it seem like she was in the elevator longer than she was, to make her behavior more erratic than it really was. Um, and I used the, the news report to kind of emphasize, hey, this is fucking real. As creepy as this is, fucking real. Um, but yeah, that one that was one of like our first ones to I mean, we've never gone viral, but that was like one of our first ones to like really like catch fire that we got a lot of response to. And that was a popular story when it came yeah. out. A lot of creepy pastas were made from that. So that that Cecil Hotel uh, one, it was refreshing because there's a lot of history with that hotel. Uh, aside from uh, Elisa, uh, Elisa, Elisa Lam, what was her name? Elisa Lam. Like aside from her, there's there's a lot of other stuff connected with that, with that. And, and it's like it's not something you went to. You yeah, always exactly. pull stuff out of the internet, right? Yeah. How is that? when you do those as as to i mean do you look do you still plan on doing more of those or do you not do you want to mostly write stuff and, and have uh, I mean, more cinema i i think there can be short there short. can be a mixture of it so what i'll do is i'll bring up another one um that's on my list because i think this is a good example of that um i did uh, a short film called never conquered rarely came yes I, that's on my list that's all right I know I said I was going to do a top five. That's another it's all good. list. So basically what, what, what this one was is um, I had got found this story about this woman who her boyfriend was suicidal and she like was encouraging him to kill himself. And then she went on trial for like, you know, yes. murder because of it. And the news archive had like the transcript of their, their text message conversations back and forth. And I'm reading this going, oh, you fucking bitch. And so, like, it inspired me to like, <clears throat> she, she does. looks evil. So when, I, when I was doing this, like, <laughs> I don't like to give myself a writing credit on it because literally I just copy and pasted their fucking text message transcript. Like, 90% of that whole short film is shit they were actually saying to each other back and forth. And when I was doing it, I knew that, like, I didn't want her to be like mustache twirling evil. Like I knew she had to be manipulative. And there was this voice actress we had worked with before. Um, Ivory doll. She used to go by the name creepy pasta doll. I don't know if she has a new name now, but she was fantastic. And when I sent her the story and kind of like pitched to her what I wanted out of the performance, she was fucking ecstatic. Cause she was just like, Oh my God, all I ever get to play are, frightened narrators and damsels in distress and somebody's girlfriend. I never get to play like a serious evil Manila, you know, person. So like she loved having like a role with some nuance to it where she could actually like have some layers to her delivery. I knew you were a feminist. Yeah. And she, she fucking killed it though. Like I remember listening she to did. her and going oh yes, this is yes. perfect you fucking bitch you nailed it yes right. i'm glad because uh i i actually followed that that when the trial was going on and i remember i saw her and i was like yeah you fucking look evil you horrible bitch you know i remember thinking that like because i saw the whole thing and i i like i read her her text message so the first time i saw that video was at uh one of the one of the um, I, I think I think Joaquin yeah. played it at one of the shows we did, uh, the the talent showcase um, for, for yeah. Evan. And I remember watching the video and I text, yeah, one of those shows. I forgot which one. I think the second one. Um, and I saw the text. And I was like, wait, this sounds familiar. And then I I watched it again by myself, and it, it was it was exactly how I pictured yeah. her texting in my head. Yeah, I, I, so it was, it was uh, 
I, it was awesome to see that, and I I enjoyed uh, like there, there's so much of, yeah. like that that they that, that was season awesome. four. That was season um, was so awesome. here's here's the thing that's interesting though. Um, I guess about ninety percent of that is true. Uh, the ending I changed. I changed the ending because in in real life Conrad died from fucking carbon monoxide poisoning, which I allude to in the video in the film. But then he he doesn't go through with it. What I did the ending actually came from another story I found of this twelve year old girl who live streamed herself hanging herself in her backyard, like this fucking twelve year old kid live streamed committing suicide. And I was like, that's fucked up. I'm going to use that as the ending to my movie. <laughs> because I thought, like, this is a cool chance to do two things. To one, not necessarily make it, like, autobiographical. Like, this is this is about suicide in general, not just this one incident. And then it also gave mm-hmm. me a chance to uh, let Michelle kind of revel in her evilness and give her a moment where she can let her guard down and just be herself and enjoy the fruits of her labor. So like, I love the fucking way creepy pasta doll just delivered that line where she's like, can I watch? And he's like, yeah, sure. Laptop. That's fucking creepy. Like, and I love her delivery on that. But what's funny with the production of this is like, I heard about the story. It took a couple months for me to get around to writing the script. And then it took another couple months to film it. And by the time I was sitting down to edit it, like a year had passed. And I remember as I was editing it, the trial verdict was coming in. And so my Facebook feed just got filled with all these people sharing the story. And I felt like a fucking hipster who like gets mad when their favorite band gets signed. Cause I'm like, you punk ass. I was following this story for a year. Where the fuck were you? Wagon hopper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so who, who's it? I, I don't know why the day, the day of the showcase, when I heard it, I thought it was Joaquin's voice. And then I, I no, watched it's it again. Our, it's our friend like, Efren. Oh, he's been our, one of our voice actors in season one. So he's been there since the beginning. Yeah, he was, was the actor. actual actor. Um, also? For the last the shot, it's a dummy that's hanging there. Okay. Um, but it's him and all the other shots. Oh, okay. Yeah, I remember hearing that story, and he. he he actually, I don't know if you remember this, but he actually got out and of the car to give as he was dying from the carbon monoxide. Yeah, that was actually the thing yeah, that, like, flinched in, the like, guilty verdict is that she told him to get back in. Yeah. That fucking horrible. And then she's all sad. So, so what's what's interesting about and, this uh, is, like, when, when I was editing it, like, there's that, I found that cover to Mad World, and I really that song I felt like the lyrics were right. very poignant Great and I touch. felt like the lyrics um, really tied into like Conrad and what he was going through especially the part where it says you know I find it kind of funny I find it kind of sad that the dreams in which I'm dying are the best I've ever had and so I wanted to use that song somewhere in the film yeah. but narratively it didn't make sense anywhere so I put it in the end credits but only like three fucking people worked on it so I was like I gotta pad these fucking credits out and so since the verdict and I was like, oh, if I actually yeah. use these news articles as like a coda, I can pad out the credits to justify using the song. But then I can also hammer home, hey, this is this basically happened. Like, this is what really went down. So I think that kind of helped it on another level. I, okay. I honestly I, think, Phil, uh, shoot, the yeah, ending, the way you tie the ending together, definitely earned you a writing credit on that. Yeah. And that's why... I- it never conquered rarely came because yeah. that's a reference to that blink 182 song because i didn't want it to be about this one suicide incident i wanted it to be about like suicide in general so i try to put in as many different suicide right. things in there as i could uh no I, it is one of my favorites but it is not on my list because wow. like i like there's <laughs> a lot of is that why i really huh is it because you're not in it? No. <laughs> Look, full disclosure, Phil and I had a conversation like before the recording, and I was like, yo, I want to stay away from stuff that I'm in and that I wrote for the most part. And then Phil was like, Psh, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm going to be real with you. Everything I'm throwing on there, I had a heavy point in doing. You should just say 
I mean, to be fair, I literally shot everything. So it's hard that, to find that one is, that I didn't do. Yeah, that is true. But I, but, but I will say this much. It was really hard to narrow down my favorites. And I also tried to guess, um, you know, I even tried to guess. I was like, all right, what is Phil going to put on his list? And what should I like? Because, you know, I, I'm a fan of 90% of, of, of everything on the channel. And um, I, I really tried to give a deep dive and service some episodes that, you know what I mean, I consider to be like classic. You know what I mean? And I didn't want the list to be like all me, all me, all me. And I figured, well, you know, Phil, I, I, I said, you know, Phil would be crazy not to put uh, a Barely Conquered, Rarely Came on his list. So I had, I had, you know, I also had some inside information, you know, some confirmation, but, but before that I, I was like, you know what, I not put it on there, but I, I would like to add a little tidbit about it though. Um, yeah, that film also ended up, um, at a film festival, neither me nor Phil, uh, could attend because, Phil, I think, was either unaware that, like, until it was too late, and I was sick as a dog on the weekend that they would have had it anyway. Yeah, it was in a festival. We weren't able to go because by the time they told us we got in, uh, I think it was like at the eleventh hour, and we already like had other plans, or I think I had a gig booked that weekend or something. So, and that was the festival. Yeah, it was. The, it was. The, the, there was one out in was Oakland. It? Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so oh, Phil had a gig and I was trying not to die. Yeah. Like I was vomiting up pea soup and oh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we got we got we got more to cover. I wanna I wanna skip uh move on okay. to the next one on your you list. You wanna know Phil. what the, we just did one off of my list, but okay, I can do another one unless just walk in. Oh sorry, okay. I, I don't know. We, we, back let's and forth. let's go back and forth because there's gonna be some overlap. Okay, so <clears throat> So yeah, I'm, I, sure. I'm, yeah. I'm going to mention, um, so on my top 10, uh, one of my top 10 is a uh, recipe for success, not wait, uh, cooking for kids. It's easy to get those two mixed up because one follows the other, but cooking for kids was the first Halloween special that Frosted Mini Fairs did. And it was one of the first videos that I had ever seen uh, of FMF. And... It was the most cinematic thing that FMF had ever done at the time. Yeah. So, little backstory on this one. Um, there was another like creepy pasta YouTuber named The Little Fears, and she was like a big inspiration for us because she was doing videos, but they were like very like minimalistic style. And Chad saw her stuff and was like, "Holy shit, we could do this, but better. Look how easy this is, Phil. We could pull this off." And no one can touch us. And so a lot of the first season, um, you can really see their influence on us to the point where I, I distinctly remember there being episodes early on where I wanted to go like more cinematic and more short film and more narrative. And Chad would kind of like crack the whip and be like, no, minimalist, stop moving the camera. Just copy what the little fears is doing. Stop moving the camera, Gavin. So she had done a story called um, Cooking for Kids about – this kid who this like this kid who finds like a, a children's cooking book <clears throat> in a, a public library, but it's got all these like ritualistic sacrifices in there. So it's fucking creepy. And so Chad wanted to do a sequel. And since we were doing it on Halloween, we thought, well, we're a horror channel. It's Halloween. We should go big. What if we make it a fucking short film? Cause that's what I've been trying to do all goddamn season. And I finally convinced him to cave and, have us do a short film. And so the story that Chad and Sal came up with was what if there's this little girl who has her own internet cooking show and she finds the, the cookbook from little fears episode and she's going to do one of the recipes that's in there. And I happen to have a puppet. So we threw the puppet in there. She's got a fucking puppet co-host. Oh, I like that one. I remember that one. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she has the fucking puppet co-host and they're doing this this ritualistic with sacrifice with like blood and ash and 
Okay, well, quick question. Who um, did you borrow this? Sal knew a guy. Actually, Chad had uh, hit me up about my brother because <laughs> okay. my brother was uh, was little at the time. And I think either he so he wasn't available. I forget what happened. But, uh, yeah, my brother would have been in that otherwise. Yeah. But uh, I remember it was like – it was like a legit thing. Like we had two cameras set up and I had like a monitor down for our puppeteer. So our puppeteer could see how shit looks like I fucking Jim Henson the hell out of this setup. But it was, it was a <laughs> lot of fun and it, it kind of, it was like, it's like Joaquin said, it was it like broke new ground for frosted mini fears. Cause it was like a short film, which we hadn't done at that point. And it got Chad and Sal like, out of that mindset that we have to copy the little fears, it got them to kind of see that, like, hey, we can do our own thing and go in a different direction, and it's fine. That's interesting to me because that's like a heavy subject to talk about, and you did it through kids, and, and then there's like this childlike kind of uh, – uh, I wouldn't say theme to that, where it's like you're talking about ritualistic stuff, but in cooking, you know, there, and cooking. There's this sense of twisted innocence. Yeah, no, there's there's a part in the episode where she's going down the recipe, and and next she's just like, you know, now we need half a cup of blood. Any blood will do. I got mine from the dogs and cats in the neighborhood, and she just says it like all nonchalant and innocent, like a kid would. I mean, really, that 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 is that unnerved me like right off the bat. You know what I mean? Like clearly, because it gives the appearance that it's this kid's TV show, but as the as the episode goes on, it's very clear that there's something there's something darker lurking under the surface, and the viewer is just kind of stuck on for this ride, and even the puppet gets uncomfortable. I mean, how many times have you seen a puppet in a kid's show get? visibly uncomfortable and kind of scared for his own, you know? Yeah, the puppet was the straight man. And, the, uh, and like, one of my favorite endings of any horror story is when they leave you with the feeling of dread. Like, something's about to happen that isn't going to be good, and then they, they don't address exactly what that is. They leave it up to your imagination. That moment when her father comes home and she's like, dad with the knife behind her back, will you help me make something? It's like, Oh crap. Yeah. <laughs> the film has it all. You know, what I mean? that brings up another question for you guys. Uh, I wanted to ask this maybe when we were done with the whole list, but I just, I, I'm wondering, have you, have you ever, have you ever like got a little uncomfortable? Not uncomfortable, but something kind of bummed you out while you were either doing research for for the frosted mini fears, or or um, or while you were doing. It? Um, as far as like out, um, I don't know. Okay, I'm I'm gonna talk about uh, an early one that's really short and most people overlook, but. It's going to tie into getting bummed out, right? We did a creepy pasta called Creepy Pasta, okay? And literally, it's a bowl of pasta and a glass of wine on a table as our narrator like reads the definition of creepy pasta. And then at the very end, the pasta fucking wiggles a little bit. Short, sweet, to the point. I fucking love it. The visual effect was super easy. Like, we literally just had my friend like, push on the fork a little bit and then we mask his hand out so that way it looks like the pasta is wiggling on its own but uh when we got done like we didn't have fucking white wine so we just used like olive oil and water to make it look like wine genius when we were done we're just like all right who wants to eat the pasta and my fat friend carlos fucking shoved people out of the way so he could scarf the goddamn (laughs) pasta down and he was real bummed out because it wasn't very good. I mean, it was made to look good, not taste good. So he was a little disappointed with the pot. When you were doing the one oh. about the suicide, I, that's what I meant. Like, so that, here's the, here's the shitty thing about doing fucking 20 scary stories every year for six years straight. Like, you get kind of desensitized to shit after a while. 
like, I, um, I don't know if I should reveal this, but I'm going to do it anyway because we're an hour in and most people probably aren't even going to make it this far into the episode. So here we go. In, in the fucking suicide one I did, right? I actually managed to find the video of the 12-year-old hanging himself on Twitch. And I superimposed it onto the laptop screen. So you see, like, the legs dangling there. If you look on the laptop, it's the video. Wait, wait, this is, this is a Yeah, real, I found the actual suicide video from that 12-year-old girl. And I put it on the laptop in the final shot. So when you see the legs dangling there, if you look on the laptop, it's a fucking 12-year-old girl hanging herself. It's subtle. Like, it's not fucking obvious. You really got to squint to look for it. And it's small. And it's in the background. But it's a little thing I did because I'm uh, a monster, I guess, at this point. I don't know. You know, um, I heard it said once on um, someone's show. They were talking about, like, comedy, the nature of comedy. And they said that people that are professional, like, sitcom writers or comedians, a lot of them, once they've told so many jokes or written so many, like funny bits in their sitcom they get to the point where they grow numb to the humor like you get so escalated that nothing makes you laugh but you're smart enough to know that it's funny right you go oh that's funny but you don't laugh because it just doesn't get you and horror operates on a similar principle with your brain where you know in order to be scared or disturbed um, there's a point where you can get desensitized right so, yeah, like I'm a mortician. I talk. There's this uh, girl I met on on Tinder. <laughs> she was a mortician, and uh, um, she told me some stuff about how you know they're just not affected by it. You know, it, it, it wasn't like you know I've heard stories about mortician or doctors work on this. She told me that she. You just be. You know, you're cutting out again, JD. I'm getting every word. Uh, you just get these. She she said that she worked on her own family members and she worked on close friends as a mortician who you know who've passed. And he, it's just like you get there, there's no limits to stuff we yeah. can synthesize as humans. I hear they encourage you when you first start doing the whole mortician thing or when you're working like you you, you know um. Like in that particular, they'll encourage you to take your lunch in the room with the bodies to help desensitize you. Yeah. Fuck. Wow. Crazy. That, that, that is, yeah, I wouldn't be able to do that, man. <laughs> but, I, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. Nah. Anyways, so, um, what, next one on your list. So we're going back to, Phil. uh, yeah. Oh, I, yeah, yeah. It's, it's now Phil's. It's, so, let me bring up my list here. What's another one uh, on my list that I could talk about? Um, okay. You know, okay. Um, uh, yeah, no, say one, say one. Oh, wait, can I say one? Sorry. Yeah. I haven't said one in a while. One of my favorites is the one you guys did about the serial killer. I just can't think of the name right now. Oh, the one on the, uh, on the game one. Show. So that was the we actually show. never like finished that one. If you look, it's called a lost episode because we were gonna do something on him in season three, and we just we couldn't break the story. We couldn't couldn't make it work. We couldn't get it to a point where we were like satisfied with it, and so we just like they didn't give this to on. me on. And then what we ended up doing is. Uh, there, there was this other you like YouTube s- kind of site called VidMe that was a thing for a while, and so we started like posting stuff on there just in case it took off. But we wanted to give people an incentive to go there instead of YouTube. We don't want to put the same shit, so we started releasing all of our like abandoned episodes over there to give people like a reason to watch us on this new platform. And then when fucking VidMe didn't take off and it crashed and burned i was like well i might as well fucking put these on youtube now but but yeah that was one where like you know we, there was this we, we found this guy rodney alcala who was a serial killer and he was very charming and he kept getting away with it and he was on the fucking dating game and we're like this is 
fucking creepy here, but we just we couldn't break the story the way we wanted to. So, uh, and, and he's that I I actually okay. So I that came up on my feed before um, before I even met you guys. That whole uh, the video like it came up on my feed randomly one day, um, and I watched it and I actually. You know, because that, that guy is not like Richard Ramirez. He wasn't like, you know, or Ted Bundy. Um, he wasn't that prolific. Um, but I was like, this is a real serial killer. Like, holy <clears throat> shit. Like, how did I miss this? Uh, and the fact that he was on a game show makes it creepier, man. Yeah. Like, that's... Yeah, because in theory, that's alive. supposed to be like a safe place. And, it, and oh, no, it's it's not. Oh, man. So, no, and then he's he's still alive. The yeah, and he can go talk to him and interview. I don't remember if I put this in the video or not, but like when he would go to trial, he would like represent himself. He would like defend himself, and he'd like question himself. He'd be like, "Now, Mister Alcala, isn't it true?" Wow, we should interview that that's, guy for an episode of Frosted Ministry. That should be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, describe him. yeah, describe the murder. Yeah, no, fuck. Yeah. What was going through your head yeah, when you were crazy. on the game show? Uh, yeah, exactly. That that's a part of that kind of uh, because when you think of serial killers, you know, and then maybe we can touch on this more with like killers in general. Um, I don't know if you guys ever sat and watched one of these interviews with killers. It seems like they can't get out of that. But a lot of these guys that they're being interviewed, they're in jail already. So they're like, you're fucked. You know, you you see the remorse when you're getting the punishment. But that guy is like sitting. And at that point, the dating game. And at that point, he's already yeah, right. probably killed a few people, right? Yeah. So it's like that fucking guy had a smile on his face. He's He, he looks like a charming young guy in the 70s, a hippie. And meanwhile, he... Who knows how many people he's already killed? Jesus, that I, I was just that was like that. Aside from the content, it was like a story I never knew about. So that was interesting to see, and I appreciate like the whole yeah. like, documentary. That was style. the direction I was thinking uh, of going because with stuff like yeah. that, I'm just like the fact that this is real makes it even creepier. You know what I mean? Yeah. With stuff like that, the direction I was trying yeah. to take was like a documentary style to play that up, but I just. I just I couldn't break the story in a way that I was satisfied with, so it just we fucking gave up, moved on, ended up releasing it as a lost episode. Okay, okay. Well, that I'm was one of my on my list. I'm glad you like, liked my half-assed yeah. attempt at yeah. a story. No, that was not half-assed, man. <laughs> you got to stop giving yourself half credit. Anyway, so next list. on, I got one on my list. I, I, I think um, it's a story that Joaquin wrote called Make a Wish. Did y'all watch Make a Wish? It's about a soldier no, overseas. His whole platoon is dead. He's in the desert. He's debating, should I just put a bullet in my head now or just wait and die of heat stroke? He's always on options he's weighing. And he sees something sparkly in the sand. He picks it up. It's a fucking oil lamp. He's dusting it off. A goddamn genie shows up. He's like, holy fucking shit, it's Robin Williams. The genie starts granting him wishes. All hell breaks loose, right? Wonderful fucking story. What's, what's, what's crazy is when Joaquin turned in the script, you know, uh, spoilers, we, we ain't got a lot of money. So when I'm reading this story about like an Iraqi soldier in the desert and a fucking genie and him teleporting, him to all these different places and all this mobs attacking him and almost even attacked by sharks in the ocean. All I can think is how in the fuck are we going to film this? <laughs> like, what the fuck? <laughs> and like, yeah, we would do like some abstract visuals here and there, but they're usually tied into the story. And I'm like, I can't just have a 15 minute shot of a lamp in the sand. That's going to be boring. So I came up with this idea to do something unique. And what I did is I like, I got some props together and I did a photo shoot with my buddy. I put him on a fucking like white backdrop, dressed him up as a soldier, gave him a toy gun, gave him a lamp, did like this whole fucking photo shoot with him. And then I went and I photoshopped him 
in the desert and photoshopped him, you know, in an alleyway. And then I took those Photoshop drawings and I turned them into like illustrations and cartoons. And then I took those illustrations and I turned them into comic book panels and I added word balloons to each one. And then I took those comic book panels and I turned them into pages. And then I took those pages into After Effects and I animated the pages turning and I animated the camera moving from one panel to the next. And I made a fucking like motion comic for this story. And it came out really nice. Like it's been in my portfolio ever since. Because it's literally like the fucking cover opens. We zoom in on the first panel. We move from panel to panel as the story progresses. You know, we hear the voiceover. We see the word balloons. Came out fucking great. It took like eight goddamn months to make this thing happen. It was so fucking in-depth. It was way more work than it was worth. But damn if it didn't come out nice. Now, yeah. I can't remember if I sent the script in before I went in the hospital or after. But... Because I, I think I was still, like, able to type and send stuff while I was, like, recovering, more or less. But I do remember that during that time, like, and, and oh, just for the listeners at home, the gentleman that starred in Barely Conquered Rarely Came is the gentleman that starred in this. Voice actor extraordinaire, Efren Aguilera. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken. And if I'm uh, and if I'm not mistaken, he also read the narrative for this too, right? Yeah, because I put him in it, so that I also had him uh, mm-hmm. as the as the the soldier. In it. I can tell you that during that time that you were working on it, I remember laying up in bed with my broken leg and you sending me screenshots of the artwork, and I remember feeling really excited, like, and it wasn't the morphine. You know what I mean? That was giving me uh, some uh, boost to help me through the pain. It was seeing the story that I wrote come to life and seeing you guys put in such effort. Yeah, it, it lifted my spirits up. You know, because that was the thing. Is like you had you had we had brought you on in se- halfway through season two because we knew Sal was on the way out, and so we needed another writer to pick up the slack and help carry the workload, and so. You were co- sort mm-hmm. of involved in season two, but not really. And then season three, you were going to be more hands on with like the production and the filming and stuff. And then like right away, you got hit by a car and you were broken leg and in the hospital. And then we went on like a four year hiatus after that. So like there's there's some pretty short sticks and props of mini fears, but we never meant to give you that short a stick, bro. Holy crap. <laughs> I mean, I don't consider it a short stick, though, because, I mean, I wrote a ton and, and yeah. like, I had a good time during you did. my involvement in season two. And it was just – and I, I voice acted quite a bit before I got hit by the car. So yeah. it's not like I was, like, totally left out. Yeah. I, it is true that I didn't get a whole lot of I, – I didn't get a whole lot of, like, camera work and stuff like that done during season three. But I was very satisfied as, like, a writer, actor. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just – and like I said, and, I'm, I'm happy but, but, it came out because it's been in my portfolio ever since. It's been in my reel. But, man, it was so much work because there were so many steps. And so, like, literally I would work on it for, like, a week at a time, like four hours a day after I get home from work for a week straight. And then just got to take a fucking break and work on something else. And then come back. So uh, just I want to I wanna, I wanna ask you about this. That you just kind of touched on something. This is all done. Yeah, like we would work full time. We would now. do all this in our free time. I mean, uh, now I make yeah. money, you know, producing videos. At the time, uh, I didn't. It was something I would. I have like a freelance gig here and there, but it wasn't like a regular thing like it is now, or at least how it got to be before the fucking pandemic. But yeah, so it just it took so much yeah. time, and so it took like eight months to work on it because I kept having to take breaks and work on other stuff, and so I'd work on it for a little bit and then move on to something else and then work on it for a bit and then move on to something else, and then eventually it like all came together. But man, that was a lot of work. So what about what's the next one? On the, uh, on well, the I just uh, did uh, I just did one, Joaquin. so I think it's Joaquin. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Joaquin. Um, the Visitor, yep. as told by Tito Boy. 
You put the visitor on there. Here's my thing. Here's my thing. I got a couple. I, I look. I chose recipe for success for the reasons I listed, but also because I really wanted to make sure that I got like a story by Sal in here. And we've had we've worked with some wonderful people who were only like, you know, who either aren't here with us anymore or are one offs. And I and I included the visitor because I thought because for one thing, it is the it is probably the only time that this actor is ever going to work with us again in part because acting and being in front of the camera the whole film stuff just wasn't his thing um he doesn't even like sitting down and watching movies for too long he's like yo i want to go out and do some martial arts sparring or yeah you know and, or hit, you know forge a sword or something he's he was, he's a very active fellow um but from what I understand, the story was is he told you guys this, like, so, so dark... Here, he, well, here's what happened. Um, okay. We had gone to this really lame college party. It was like one of those college parties that's, like, sanctioned by the college. Right? And, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Those are those are the parties where you would sell the most so, drugs. Well, we show up at this dealers. party. It's like a costume party. There's like eight people there. Our friend is the only one drunk. He showed up drunk and was the only one there drunk. Everybody else was sober. Um, even the fucking security guard is like, you got to get your friend out of here. And we're like, friend? We don't know him. <laughs> <laughs> but what we friend. were in the car on the way back and he was ranting and raving about how much he hated Sal. And he was like, Sal's such a shitty goddamn, I could come up with a better story than Sal. And he like drunkenly improv this story called the visitor. And so as I don't know if it was as a joke or if he was serious, but Chad was like, you should record that. So we did like, I got together with him later on at his place and we recorded it and like we were just like sitting on his bed but i put up like a black backdrop and i had like a light with a dimmer switch that i'm flicking to make it look like there's a flame in front of him and he just i just fucking recorded him telling the story um but he's a bit of a method actor so he got drunk again while he was telling the story and it ended up on for like 15 goddamn minutes oh, wow. and my arm felt like it was gonna fall off and then we had to go to ocean beach to film it because we wanted to have like an actual bonfire so we fucking go to san francisco we go to ocean beach we we're trying to start a bonfire it's hella fucking windy he's freezing he's dressed like a filipino so he has like a straw hat and like a burlap shirt what what the hell like, is, like okay. someone from the well, say, like the someone who lives in a mud hut right you can literally be dressed as a boss okay, fair in the backyard. So I, he's I, not filming like he's a burlap you know shirt, he's a straw hat. He's freezing to death because it's like wait, wait, fifty-two wait. degrees. What did you say? Right. What? Can you hear Gaspar? No, I just said that I thought what you meant was that he's a Filipino who happened to be dressed. <laughs> I mean that's pretty applicable too. <laughs> and so we're just like at this beach, like shooting him sitting around the bonfire. So we can cut back and forth and we're getting reaction shots of Chad and Joaquin listening to him tell this story and sand got everywhere. I had to clean out all my gear. It was a nightmare of a shoot, but uh, I'm not going to lie. It's a little rambly to be fair. He was intoxicated when he recorded it. So that probably has something to do with it, but mm. yeah, that was okay. And then uh, so I that was on your on your li on yeah, my was, list. I I really I I really enjoyed his his thick accent. I liked the way he told the story and how he added character to it. And I re I remember like how it took us forever trying to get the dog on fire started to the point to where he had to like go over to another 
uh, like another bonfire and just be like, hey, can I bring some some fire over? And he came over like, I have fire. Like it was like Prometheus, you know, like. Um, but no, I just it was a once in a lifetime performance. I felt like he had a great thick accent on. He looked like he belonged on someone's island. You know what I'm saying? And uh, yeah, that's why that's that's one of the films that that stands out for me. It was a very you know like I, I had a good time at the beach. It sounds like Phil doesn't remember it as fondly as I do, but um, yeah, it's definitely one of my top ten. Okay. Okay. All right. What about and, so? Oh, what, going back and, to and yeah, one Phil, more thing uh, about it having a ghost story or rather like a supernatural story from another culture I thought was really, really exciting. That that was one of the things like, I'm sorry, now I'm done. Okay. All right. Um, so we, let, let's, let's, let's go through the next one. Well, what's, I'm trying to think, uh, what I have left on my list. I put too many things on my list. I need to learn how to fucking count. Um, all right. You know what? I'm going to, I'm going to, here's what I'm going to do. Bam. I'm going to talk about tolerance. Do y'all know Tolerance? Yep. Crickets, okay. Yep. Tolerance. Wait, wait, do I know what? Do I know, the, like... I the, saw my list. It's a short film. Is this a it's film? A film. It was our season two Halloween okay. special. Uh, it won the Audience Choice Award at the, the Berkeley Horror Film Festival. Um, this is basically... That is the oh, torture, the torture porn, porn one. one. Yes! Right? <laughs> that's what I, that's what I like, call it. Didn't it didn't have a name. I forgot the name. So, if you're attracted to to, to Joaquin, go ahead and watch. So the the, the backstory it's, it's behind this one is, um, we had a completely different film planned for the end of season two, and Chad was just really burnt out and needed a break, and so he like went on sabbatical, even though we don't fucking pay ourselves. So how can you, whatever he fucking took a break. Right. And so it was up to me to then come up with and produce and direct and shoot and edit the Halloween special. So I came up with this super last minute because it was something we could do on the cheap with very little actors and very little budget. So it's just it's it's Joaquin getting tortured by Efren. And what it is, is we film this in like a like a storage closet, like a maintenance closet at uh, at Tito Boy's gym. And, you know, and it was one yeah, of those things okay. where um, we, we, I didn't want there to be a lot of story. What I wanted to do is there's that whole mentality of, you know, show up late, leave early. That way people are always wanting more. And so that's what I wanted yeah. to do here. So I literally just drop people in the middle of the situation. The, the movie starts. Joaquin is tied to a chair. He's got a fucking gash on his head. He's got a black eye. Looks like he's been there a while. Fucking Efren appears in the corner and just spends the next like five minutes torturing him. He has a fucking nutcracker. What's that? What did, what did, quick question. What did you use for um, bones or the crunching? And all normally that? I would have like tried. Why is actually my bones break? Yeah. Well, no. What I tried to do is I, I, I would have tried to record sounds if I had time. But here, I literally just went online and just like sound effects, and then put an oh, EQ okay. on them, okay. and like tried to mix them so it sounds somewhat natural. Put like a reverb on there, but literally for like five minutes, Efren fucking tortures this poor boy. He like cracks his knuckles with a nutcracker. He fucking grabs some jumper cables, which is hooked up to the the maintenance wall on the side there, and he fucking electrocutes the dude with jumper cables. He fucking gets a handful of salt and slaps it right in the dude's open wound. He fucks this motherfucker up, right? And then my whole thing is we were we were kind of stuck on this mentality of it has to have a twist. It's not a creepy pasta if it's not a twist. And it was starting to get to the point of almost like M. Night Shyamalan parody where it's like, what a twist. So when I was writing this, this is like one of the first things I wrote by myself and so I was like well there has to be a twist there has to be a fucking twist and so I came up with the idea of oh what if like a fucking cute nurse shows up at the end is like oh your 11 o'clock is here oh thank you Janice I'll be right out and we fucking leave people going away what the hell what did I just watch what's going on and I didn't really put much thought into what it actually means 
it was literally just, wouldn't this be a twist that would confuse people? Which is a little Vince Russo-ish, you yeah. know, swerving people just for the sake of swerving. But uh, it I, came out great. I'm happy with it. I honestly feel the twist was the main reason that I jumped at it because it was like, when I was reading the first few pages, I was like, "Oh, this is just this is just saw." Okay, whatever. Because I'm not really a big, you know, <laughs> I'm not really into that genre of horror. But the moment that the nurse comes in and says, "You know, your third your your ten o'clock appointment is here," and he's like, "Tell Miss Janice I'll be right out," or he's like, "Thank you, Janice. Tell her I'll be right out." Like that moment gives you a certain level of hopelessness for my character. Because if – let me explain it this way. The way I took it was that implies that it's not just me being kept here secret by one person, that there's this other person who also knows um, that I am being tormented, and they're not going to do anything about it. It's an organization. You know, and that – this is a doctor. It's, a, it's an organization of, of it's, of it's the revelation that this is a professional doctor who probably has me in the hospital basement torturing me for 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 giggles for fun and he's going upstairs to handle his normal business how long have i been down there how long have i been kept there how long will i last you know it, there's all these questions that that come up for the viewer there's all this concern that i had for my character like he's never getting out he's never getting out you know what i mean like the nurses and on he's never getting out like this they, they totally know uh, what did my character do to put himself in this position so to me that's the nature of the twist is that it, it makes it even worse and it leaves you with the sense of dread the sense of like not knowing what's going to happen next for this character yeah you know so the fact that you yeah, and I was, I was going to say one thing, and um, when we were, and this kind of like speaks to like my mentality writing, it's like I put the twist in there without thinking, well, what does this twist mean? It's more like, well, it has to have a twist. I'll just let people make up whatever they think this twist means. Whatever is creepiest to them, that's what it is. And so even the name Tolerable, when we were filming it, it didn't really have a name. We didn't know what we were going to call it, and it wasn't until I was editing it when I was like, uh, fuck it, tolerance, with no re rhyme or reason behind it other than this is a word that people can you know, imprint whatever meaning they want onto it, whether it's racial tolerance or pain tolerance, whatever, whatever the, it means to them, they can imprint onto this short film. So if this is like a prime example of like uh, – my hackiness as a writer to throw some shit out there, let people make up their own meaning behind it. Hey, it won an award. Look at that. Mission accomplished. You know what my favorite story about that uh, about that film is? When you guys told me that you took it out to, to show it at some uh, horror festival and it was uh, show, shown with yeah, like, so other kid... The, the film horror festival it was at, which we won, by the way. Like, it's a horror film festival. So I'm thinking, oh, man, this is going to be great. And then, like, the first short film is, like, someone recreated the the scene from Halloween with Michael Myers and Jamie Lee Curtis. But it's Curious George and the man in the yellow hat. And I'm like, what the fuck? And I look around, and there's, like, little kids sitting in a crowd. And I'm like, oh, no. Oh, no. And then, like, when our film comes on, it's very quiet, and there's, like, this awkward silence over the whole crowd. And I didn't put any music to it because I wanted it to, like, feel more brutal. I was thinking of, like, the fight scene with Batman and Bane and Dark Knight Rises where there's no fucking music. It's just the sound of Batman getting his ass kicked for 10 minutes. And so same thing here. There's no music. There's just the sound yeah. of this guy brutally getting tortured. And so I'm just looking around and people are like visibly uncomfortable. Somebody gets up and leaves. And then like when it finishes, there's not even any music over the credits. It's just a loop of Joaquin like whimpering in pain. And then fade to black. And then there's like this delay and then a slow applause. And I'm like, oh, this was weird. 
but it won. But it did what we wanted it to do. It disturbed people that horrified him, and we won. We whooped that king of joy. Nice. All right. So yeah, now Martin, what's next on your list, Joaquin? One. Who's got the next? Light bulbs. Light bulbs. Okay. Interesting. 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 Why? Why? Not? I really. I don't know. That. I like. You know what? Two things. One, we had a rare and one-time um, performance from uh, one Gerald Patrick. And I thought he was an excellent. Uh, I thought he was an excellent like actor for for this because you know he played a security guard whose detail was relatively simple, right? Um, I'm a big. I like ghost stories, and I thought it was a very clever ghost story. Um, and it was it was simply shot, and as well narrated. It's yeah. I, I wanted my um, my list to show like the variety for FMF, and I feel like. Um, this is this is sort of on like the simpler end of things, you know what I mean? Whereas like Recipe for Kids was more cinematic and and the big breaking point, but this is more of a meeting in the middle. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, but yeah, watching I think it was like maybe one of the first films that I worked with you on, where I was just sort of like tailing around and like, all right, this is how he this is how he does this, is how you do it. You know what I mean, and uh, the, the concept I thought was really, really cool. You know, I no good. No, what are you gonna say, James? Oh, right. no. This I just want to before this, Joaquin. You weren't really involved with film, right? Um. Oh, you mean before Frost at Minifears? Um. Actually, yeah. I was. It was. Uh, it was black suits. Oh, so this is before okay, black, yeah, black suits before, before Frosted, Frosted Mini okay. Fears. Right. And if you want to get and which is on IOP and video. Before uh, IOP video, there was also the backyard wrestling stuff, which I came up with scripts and storylines and ideas for and was a creative force behind and even manned the camera once or twice back in the PWL days. So mm-hmm. I've kind of been at least dabbling in film since I was in high school. <laughs> Okay. All right. Okay, well, I I'm say is, sorry, I, Phil. I, don't I actually don't it. have any real fond memories from Lightball because I remember mm. uh, trying to record the narration with the with the actor who was in it, and it was like pulling teeth because this motherfucker had goddamn ADD up the fucking ass, and like the story is like three minutes long, and it took us forty five minutes to record it because he kept getting distracted and he kept wanting to start over. And he'd get like one sentence out and been like, "Are you guys hungry? We should get lunch. Are you ready? Do you want to get Jack and burger?" And we're like, it literally got to the point where me and Chad were like snapping our fingers and jiggling. He's like, "Hey, hey, over here, focus, focus, focus." Can you write on the? Yeah, chat I think you have that ADHD I mean, I or something. But you know, the end result so is did, nice. So what you were working with? You were working with Buddy the Elf? <laughs> I might as well have. He'd have got some work done. He wasn't one of our regulars. He had done like an episode of uh, Black Suits with us and directed an episode of Black Suits. And I, actually. I was trying to give him a chance, and holy shit, no wonder that motherfucker never did nothing. Yeah, he was he was probably better at, at directing actors than he was at, at reading yeah. scripts or okay. Yeah, all right, but... all right, all right. I got, I got one. I got one. I got one. Okay. I don't, I still have a bunch. Of Some of these aren't. Which? Uh, oh, 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 oh! I think I'm gonna do. I think I'm gonna do. Oh God! You know what? We might. We, we got to talk about this. I'm going to talk about Live Evil. Word. This, live I Evil. It right? to be live no, it's Live Evil. Evil. Oh, it's live evil. Oh, shit. This what was, was to date, the last episode of Frosted Mini Fears. This is how we ended season four. And mm-hmm. What was crazy about it is it was very thrown together last minute. Like, you remember, Joaquin, we were trying to come up with an idea for the, 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 the episode and 
Chad was burnt out. We were all kind of burnt out. And we're out of money and out of time. And we were just trying to think of something simple that we can knock out in a weekend. And Chad had come up with this idea of, well, what if it's like, you know, a guy being chased and then the person chasing them is themselves. And that's literally yep. what we had to go off of. That's all we came up with in like a 45 minute me brainstorming session. That's all we came up with. And in his initial pitch, wow. you didn't really see the assailant until the very end, I don't think. Like, the very last thing. Yeah. And yeah, you fleshed that out quite a bit, my friend. Yeah, we did. And I was trying to think, like, okay, well, there ain't a lot here. So the world that we're going to be in is going to be doing most of the heavy lifting. So we got to have some interesting location. And I had found that abandoned ghost town out in san jose called drawbridge and i was like well a fucking ghost town that's perfect and there's these train tracks that lead to the island because that's the only way to get there and i was like oh shit there's train tracks in point richmond too i can use that abandoned building in point richmond and use those train tracks as like a way to connect these two locations together and then from there it kind of morphed into oh it can be what if we do like a found footage movie what if it's a vlog what if it's a guy vlogging while he's doing urban exploration shit gets out of hand and the reason why i love this episode so much is it reminded me of like the early the good old days of frosted mini fears because by this point the show we we've been doing it for so long and we've gotten so good at stuff that like everything was meticulously scripted devil's do was storyboarded shot for shot like we would plan shit out. And with this, we had like a rough outline. Like we knew some story beats we wanted to hit, but most of it, we just fucking made it up while we were filming. Like me and Joaquin just like hung out in point Richmond and came up with that idea. like, Oh, what if you do this? But well, what if I do this? What if I turn around and you're fucking there? And then I turn around and you're not there. Oh, fuck. Where'd you go? Like shit like that. And we like made shit up as we went and we like improv the whole thing. And it was very kind of freeing to do that because then when I'm sitting in the edit, I can kind of piece this story together and shape it. And I have all this freedom to try out different things and figure out exactly what the story is going to be. And we had a lot of fun doing it. It was, it was very freeing. It was very laid back. It was one of the one of the chillest shoots we had done. And a lot of it was because we had all this experience from doing everything we'd done on the show before. So it was at a point where I'm just like, oh, I know how to do this effect here because I've done it before. I know how to do this effect because I've done it before. So we were able to just be real free while while filming this. What what are you what are you what are your thoughts on Live Evil, Martin? Since you know you were in it mostly. Yeah, you were. Yeah, you, were the star. Well, you know what? I love filming Live Evil. I was on board the moment Chad came up with the concept, and I was like, that's brilliant. Like in my mind, I'm like, okay, you're gonna have this dude with a hoodie who's like running around you know what i mean I, I and then the way we fleshed it out and the way we ended up telling the story like the convention of literally going from one world to another essentially like the character kind of gets uh transported based on where he's he's running to and who he's running from um that was a lot of fun i i i pride myself on like you know, yeah, I'm going to like crank out the script and come up with this outline and then get this, you know, get the story going. And it was like, I think the first time that I had been involved in a film where everything was completely run and gun and we just sort of made everything up as we went along. And I really enjoyed it because it was a fresh experience. You know what I mean? And I, I can't remember. I, I'm, I'm feeling like one of those old school comic book creators because I know that Phil and I both bounced ideas off each other but i can't remember which one of those were mine <laughs> you know what i mean yeah you know it's like yeah stan lee how much of like fantastic four was his and how much was jack kirby and it's just kind of like a oh, uh, 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 50 50 split i don't know <laughs> but it was that's how organic it was yeah you know? and i remember it was it was crazy because when we went to uh that ghost town like it's like a two mile hike there, two mile hike back. And um, mm -hmm. that was pretty brutal. And then you have to like walk along these train tracks to get to the ghost town. And the train tracks are still in use. 
So you have to time. That was the hardest part. So you have to time it. So you're not on the tracks when a train is coming. So that was a thing. Um, and then the whole island is sinking. So like, it was actually really dangerous to be there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it was a lot of, it, it's weird. Cause I'm really happy with it. It was the, probably the most fun I've ever had working on the show. And I'm very proud of how it came out, especially with how run and gun and loosey goosey and improv it was, uh, you know, me being a perfectionist, like in hindsight, being a motherfucker, like looking at it now, like the only thing I kind of wonder if I should have changed is the way it is now, as I put credits in there, cause I was really inspired by this YouTube channel called local 54 that does that. And so I wanted to do that because I'm like, have like the credits and then there's like a post credit scene and i'm almost wondering like would it have been scarier if it just ended there if it just ended with a long shot and you hear the sounds of the distance getting fainter and fainter and we just try and pretend it's real like at the time i didn't want to do that because i'm just like i can see the comments now we're gonna have people going fake you can see the cross dissolve fake so that's why i put the credits in there but I'm almost wondering, would it have been scarier if I didn't do the credits? And instead of calling it Live Evil, if I just called it something like Urban Exploration Blog Number 9, you know, and just try and pretend like it's real. I almost wonder if that would have made it better. Speaking of Urban Blog, uh, uh, Urban, uh, what, was it, what, what are those videos called? Urban Explorers? Yeah, the over Urban Explorers, um, yeah. Phil and I just talked about something, uh, doing a Urban Exploration. So hopefully... The next time we talk about anything, yeah, definitely. I mean, it all depends on if the world is still on fire or not. Yeah, yeah, because everything, everything, everything. There's nothing on frosted mini fears that's scarier than 2020. <laughs> right. All right. Well, <laughs> we have a lot of work to do to catch up to that. I think Anyways, we're, I think um, we're reaching the end here. We got about like five minutes left. Joaquin, do you have anything you want to close us out on? Oh my goodness! I don't even think we got done with our list, but I I, I will throw out. Can we keep? Can we? Can we? I mean, it? we can. There's going to be more Halloweens. We can come back to this next Halloween. Yeah. Okay. That's and by true. then, that's hopefully, true. we'll have some new shit to throw on the list too. Agreed. Agreed. That is very true. I I, I, I would I like do. to mention before we close out, our fathers has a special place. Um, in my heart because it was the first time that I directed uh, an actor just, just on voice direction. And it was with our um, production assistant, uh, uh, Angela. And she did a beautiful job playing this damaged daddy's girl. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. You, you did a great job. She killed it. You got a great performance out of her. I remember that one father. Yeah, and I and I wrote it, and we 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 did that. We got together, I think, a weekend or two before I ended up breaking my leg, and we handled that business. And she didn't want to do it at first, and I was like, she was like, well, whatever I can do to help out, because Angela's so sweet. But then she was like, I kind of don't, and I was like, Angela, trust me, if I didn't think if you if you couldn't do it, if you absolutely didn't have the ability to do it, I wouldn't be pushing you to do it. I'm feeling you can do it. You're exactly what I need. And then she listened to me. And thank you, Angela, if you are listening. God bless you. Like, you made it You made it everything. And Phil, your editing, of course, is always top-notch, man. Oh, why, why, thank you. Why, thank you. But that was, that was some of our favorite Frosted Mini Fears episodes. We're celebrating the Halloween season with some spooky shit. So I urge all of y'all, check out Frosted Mini Fears. Check out everything we talked about today. There's even more on there. JD Gasper, do you guys have anything you want to throw? Real quick, real quick. Yes, uh, Phil is the heart that pumps the blood that runs through the fucking arteries of Frost and Mini Fear. So, Phil, you are that for the voice party too. So, thank you from the bottom of my heart. No problem. That's what I do. That's what I do. You rock, Phil. Um, yeah, dude, I just want to say that, and uh, I'm excited to see something that I like contribute to in Frosted Mini Fear. So, uh, that's why oh, I'm excited. It's coming, listeners. 
we're, we're working on something. We're working on a couple of things, actually. Something that I still need uh, to, to, you know, I've collaborated with uh, Joaquin here. We spent the whole day talking about, which we still are working on, but um, I, I hope we can get, you know, the vaccine so yeah. we can start doing this shit. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, so this is the voice party. Check out Frosted Mini Fears. Enjoy your Halloween season. You're probably not going anywhere because, you know, the pandemic. But whatever. Enjoy some spooky shit. Make the most of your Halloween. Thank you for tuning in. We are out. Out. Mass guarantee.